people will start connecting. So good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to our third Brussels Dialogue organized by the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels. My name is Mirto Arvaniti and I will be your host today. Uh, today, our distinguished guests will discuss a theme that the whole world is grappling about. How do we mainstream biodiversity across the agricultural sector? Uh, what are the linkages with the European Green Deal and the global response to COVID-19? My colleagues will insert in the chat box some housekeeping rules, which you can also see on these slides. We want to keep the FAO Brussels dialogues as interactive as possible and answer live as many of the audience's questions as we can. We will also try to cover any unanswered questions with some key takeaways after the event. So let me run you through uh, the agenda today very quickly. After a short welcome from a director, uh, Rodrigo de la Puerta, uh, we will go directly into asking questions to our high level panelists and we will kindly ask them to give us their remarks in four minutes. Following this, our technical panel will take questions and endeavor to reply within two minutes. In the meantime, please do use the Q&A box you see at the bottom of your screen to ask your questions to our panelists. Just make sure to indicate uh, the, for which panelist the question is. Um, given the very high uh, number of registrations we received for this event, we have also set up the possibility for people to follow us via live streaming on YouTube. Let me remind you that both the recording and the YouTube will be available on both our fao.org org slash Brussels uh, website and sent to you by email after the event. So we are very honored to have with us today FAO Deputy Director General, Mrs. Maria Elena Semedo, who will open the high level part of our morning. UN Environment Programs Deputy Executive Director and Assistant Secretary General of the UN, Mrs. Joyce Misuya. She will take the floor immediately afterwards to give us the organization, uh, the UNEP uh, perspective. And we will then hear from the representatives of the European Union. Mr. Daniel Calleja Crespo, Director General for Environment, and Mrs. Carla Montesi, Director of the Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development. They will talk to us about the Green Deal, and hopefully not only, about much more. Uh, the second part of this morning will then start. We have uh, expert panelists who are looking forward to answering your questions and interacting with you. We have with us today from FAO Mete Wilkie, Director Forestry Policy uh, and Resources Division, Eduardo Mansour, Director Land and Water Division, and Manuel Barange, Director Fisheries and Aquaculture Policy and Resources Division. From the UN Environment Program, we are very pleased to be joined by Salman Hussein, Coordinator for the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity and Acting Head of the Ecosystem Services Economics Unit. Immediately after the technical panel, we will hear from His Excellency, the Ambassador of Costa Rica to their own base agencies and the Holy See, Mr. Federico Zamora Cordero. And we will also have a very short intervention from the member of the European Parliament, Mrs. Marlene Mortler. Let me start by giving the floor to Rodrigo de la Puerta, director of the FAO Liaison Office in Brussels, and ask him to also try to be a bit brief. Rodrigo. Thank you very much, Mirto, uh, and I will follow your guidance uh, and will be brief. Excellencies, uh, colleagues ah. and friends, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this third FAO Brussels Dialogue organized by the Food and Agriculture Organization Office in Brussels, this time in close cooperation um, uh, with the UN Environment uh, Program. Uh, a few days ago, we celebrated biodiversity and the environment, but the dramatic situation uh, we are going through did not allow us to go to the beautiful countryside in Belgium or as well. Yet, it made us all appreciate our nature even more. Today, we're gonna talk about biodiversity. We're gonna talk about our nature being lost. Estimates say that more than 1 million species are facing extinction. And you will agree with me that this is a shocking number. We need biodiversity not only to produce safe, healthy, and nutritious food, but also to su supply vital ecosystem systems as you will see in a one-minute video in a second. 
We are very pleased, as Mirto said, uh, to have such a fantastic panel with us, and we thank all of them for accepting our invitation. I think the partnership between the European Union and the United Nations is vital. There are so many projects we are developing together, some of them extremely innovative, that aim at restoring degraded lands, at preserving forests, wildlife, sustainable fisheries, but at the same time, at ensuring food security for the population. The EU ambitious farm to fork and biodiversity strategies want to strengthen the protection of our environment and biodiversity and support the transformation of our food systems. We will hear more about that from Daniel Calleja Crespo and Carla Montesi. And we're also pleased to have in the audience Lucas Visek from the cabinet of Timmermans, the first vice president of the commission. FAO and UNEP renewed their partnership ag uh, agreement in uh, September 2019, adding new areas of cooperation. The participation today of the two deputy heads of both organizations, Mariana Semedo and Joyce Musuya, is a clear example of this close collaboration. Investing in nature not only makes environmental sense, it also makes financial sense. Our food depends on the health of our ecosystems and our economies and livelihoods rely heavily on nature and its resources. And in all this, a one health approach is crucial. The words of the FAO Director General Chi Dong Yu during the celebration of the World Environment Day were echoed by many delegates in the ceremony. And allow me to quote him here. I wish we could all keep in mind that every day should be World Environment Day. Day. I thank you all for joining us today, and I look forward to a very fruitful debate. Over to you, Mirt. Thanks so much, Rodrigo. Uh, let's go directly into the video. The theme is Our Biodiversity. Video, please. Ms. Semedo, 2020 was supposed to be the super year for nature. And while the COVID-19 pandemic means that many scheduled events, as you know, like the Conference on Climate Change and Biodiversity have been postponed, it also puts a greater spotlight on biodiversity and how so many solutions for the world's challenges can be found in nature. So Ms. Semedo, how does FAO mainstream biodiversity and integrate nature-based solutions in food and agriculture. Many people also talk about the One Health approach, as you mentioned earlier. Why is this so important? Thank you, Mirtu, and uh, good morning, uh, dear uh, Joss Musua, Deputy Executive Director, One Environment Program. Uh, we are very happy and honored for the group, very good cooperation we have between FAO and UNEP. Some weeks ago, we celebrated together the Biodiversity Day, where we launched the, the SOFO. And this shows the strengthened cooperation uh, we have between our two institutions. Uh, Daniel Kaleja Crespo, my dear friend, Director General of Environment, I could have and be more happy than being with you here today in this debate. I remember some two years ago when we started discussing about biodiversity strategy and the European Union biodiversity strategy and a very 
great and huge congratulations for your achievement. Carla Montesi, also my dear friend, I know how you have nature, uh, food security in your heart, and very glad to be with you in this panel. Uh, Marlene Motter, a member of the European Parliament, dear colleagues, friends, excellencies, very happy to be with you today in this very important third Brussels FAO dialogue. As it has been said, 2020 has been pegged the sub super year for nature. We have so many meetings planned for this year, uh, the climate, the COP25, uh, the COP13, where we were supposed to have a 2020 framework on biodiversity, only to name some, but unfortunately, to the pandemic, many of us has to be scheduled and to be postponed. But to me, at the same time, it was important because the pandemic put an even greater spotlight on biodiversity and sustainable use of natural resources. Na nature is calling us. And for, uh, for more than three years, FAO has been, has been strengthened its work in reconnecting agriculture with ecosystem processes and services, linking consumers and urban society with food producers. We agree, and I think all of us, we came at the conclusion that we need to reconcile agriculture with biodiversity and to change the way agriculture were looked at as the, the origin of all of the problems, but also being part of the solution. And we are trying to pave a new road for FAO to make sustainable agriculture and food system the backdrop of FAO technical work with a view to delivering healthy food and prosperity for all while preserving our planet natural resources. So to answer to your question, Miti, how does FAO maintain biodiversity and integrate nature-based solution in food and agriculture? First of all, I would like to start by saying that we all know that we have to improve a cross-sector collaboration. We cannot see agriculture in isolation. And we have uh, to, we need to have a multi-stakeholder engagement and cooperation in management of biodiversity for food and agriculture. We cannot be isolated. We need an integrated and a multi-stakeholder engagement. And I could say systemic approach. The agriculture world and the environment world tend to ignore each other, but they depend on each other. And fragmentation between resource management, producers, value chain operators, advocate and policy makers is a key problem we are facing. This is again, the need to put all the stakeholders together and to have a common approach. I strongly believe that agriculture holds the key to bringing all these actors together and to addressing at the same time climate change adaptation, mitigation, food security and land degradation in a holistic manner. In FAO, we work in several solutions, but I would just mention agroecology is a concrete example on what we do to reconcile producers and consumer sides in order to unlock system change for sustainable food and agriculture. Agroecology is part of FL's common vision for sustainable food and agriculture. 
this common vision for sustainable food and agriculture, it brings a transition for an agroecologic system. It seeks to optimize the interaction between plants, animal, humans, and environment, while taking into consideration the social aspects, as well as what we call the 10 elements of agroecology adopted by FAO member countries through a very uh, extensive dialogue into the organization. It is a non-prescriptive analytical and technical tool which the members and the countries and the city can use where we talk to a transition to a more agroecological practices. And it's aiming to help countries to operationalize the transition to agroecology. We support FAO members to include agroecology in their agriculture policies. And this is the next steps of work for us. I know that the question of sustainability is also at the center of European Union. And sustainability has so many uh, definitions. What is really the meaning sustainability, but I believe a farm to fork strategy for a fair, healthy and environmentally friendly food system, as well as the biodiversity strategy as part of the European Green Deal brings the key for sustainability, a more sustainable European system as we referred before. FAO firmly believes that we have to put nature at the center of the way in which we produce. And the current pandemic has underlined the urgent need, how we can take nature into consideration as the starting point of whatever we do. And the question we now have in front of us, what learn from the current pandemic and what should be the role for nature and biodiversity in building a better agriculture sector as, or as some people are saying now, how we can build better forward looking. And this then brings me to your uh, last question, Mirti. What is on the importance on, of the One Health approach? Let's look forward. And I think the most important is how we can prevent future pandemic. It's important that we understand the current one, why and how it happened. But in our views, the most important is what can we do all together to avoid that new pandemics will occur. But the restoration and sustainable management of productive systems and landscape is fundamental to build forward and transform after COVID-19. Therefore, FAO is very proud to be co-leading with UNEP, the United Nations Decade on Ecosystem Restoration 2021-2030. And I think maybe Matt or Eduard will take later, talk later about what we are doing and what is the aim of this ecosystem restoration decade. But just to give you some idea, the aim is supporting and scaling up efforts to prevent, halt, and reverse the degradation of the system wide, and how we can restore ecosystem for better production. To adopt an ecosystem approach globally, globally we must tackle a one health approach. 
towards the health of people, animal, and our ecosystems, recognizing that they are interconnected and interdependent. We cannot look only on the uh, human health without forgetting the environment and animal health and vice versa. There is much evidence point, pointing to landscape change and biodiversity loss as being the key drivers of the emergency of infectious diseases. An effective implementation of the One Health approach is the most likely to reduce disease transmission risk. We have been discussing in FAO with our partners about the One Health approach, what we have done, what we need to improve, and one of the recommendations is the ecosystem part of the approach maybe is the one we have putting less attention and we need to increase our attention in the linkage between human animal health and also environment or ecosystems. Nevertheless, today, most One Health efforts have provided the most significant resources to the public health sector, followed by the veterinary services. However, as it has been said, it has becoming apparent that supporting the forestry and wildlife sectors, as well as responsive land use planning, are equally important. We just launched uh, some weeks ago, the state of, um, of forestry and the forest resource assessment, which is showing us that although the forestry is, is in still increasing, the path is decreasing, but it's alarming the way we are still deforestation. Nevertheless, to date, most One Health efforts have provided the most significant resources to the public health sector, followed by veterinary services. However, it has become apparent that supporting the forestry and wildlife sector, as well as responsive land use planning, are equally important. In this regard, the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program, which aims to tackle the wild meat challenge by addressing both wildlife conservation and food security, is an excellent example. And I would like to take this opportunity to thank the European Union for their financial support, complement and strengthen the One Health approach building on existing sustainable wild management program. The objective of this project will be to increase the understanding and assessment of the zoonotic risk along the wild meat supply chain, from the forest to both rural and urban consumers. It will also assist countries to build their capacity to predict zoonotic risk and to set up measures to prevent and mitigate those risks and their consequences on public health, food systems, and biodiversity. And again, here I wanted to say that what we need to do is to tackle the disease at risk. But we cannot forget that wildlife provide food security for millions provide livelihoods for millions of people. And whatever solutions we have, we need a balance between the social, the economic, and the environment consequences. The current COVID-19 situation is highlighting the key role of small uh, farmers and the importance of short food supply chains 
in feeding the local population. These are signs that the current crisis could accelerate a shift to the development of shorter food supply chain and sustainable food systems in line with the European Union Green Deal. And I believe one of the lessons learned from the COVID-19 is that we need to promote local markets. We need to see how we can reduce the distance between producers and consumers. But a new challenge will come, the food safety of the, those small and local markets. Therefore, FAO welcomes the effort to put by the European Union to develop, to develop both initiatives, a farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy. They are all interlinked. The strategies set the curse for the transformation of the entire agriculture sector in line with recent scientific finding modeling sustainable food system. We need a healthy diet based on sustainable food system. The way we produce, the way we, we transform, and the way we consume, they need to be all interlinked and they need to be all sustainable. We look forward to a close collaboration in their implementation from the farm to fork external dimension, which could influence the global agriculture development agenda, especially in Africa and for the biodiversity strategy with the objective to adopt a post-2020 global biodiversity framework in the, at, at the next COP of the Conference of Biodiversity. And I would like to conclude by saying that not only on, on this uh, state of uh, forestry, as I mentioned, but FAO also launched some days ago the state of fisheries and aquaculture, which shows that we are not sustainably management, managing our fisheries and uh, our fisheries resources. We need, again, more sustainability in the way we use our natural resources. And this is our joint, our common uh, responsibility to take care of our nature. With this, I would like to conclude by saying we have to work hand in hand and our collective work on sustainable food systems will pave the way for the Food Systems Summit 2021. And I believe the Food Systems Summit will provide us an opportunity where we'll be able to bring together nature and the way we consume, we produce, and not only to take into consideration one part, but we need a global and systemic approach towards our Food System Summit 2021. And, and again, I was saying I was concluding, but I cannot conclude without informing that in the in 23rd of uh, June, we'll be having in the launch Green Deal and the Biodiversity Strategy in a panel where the Director General with Ambassador Jan Tombinski will be opening the event. And we in FAO will be very happy to welcome you and to share what is the new challenge, what is the content of the New Deal, the new Green Deal and the Biodiversity Strategy to FAO constituency. Thank you again and look, looking forward for a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Over to you, Mirto. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Semedo, and thank you for announcing this very important event on the 23rd of June. Uh, more details uh, will be announced uh, very shortly. I turn quickly to you.
and Mrs. Sam Suya. Uh, the world is facing uh, unprecedented challenges with the COVID-19 pandemic, and of course, everybody is trying to tackle first and foremost the public health emergency. But I'm sure you would agree with me that our long-term response must also address the disruption of nature's balance. So what are the key challenges agriculture and food systems are facing and which have been exacerbated during the COVID-19 crisis? Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Marto. And let me recognize uh, our colleagues at uh, FAO, starting with Maria Elena Semedo and her team for an excellent collaboration that we have received from you. Uh, very warm greetings to our European Commission friends, uh, Daniel and Carla, and uh, special greetings as well to Marlene Amorta from the European Parliament and all the participants. Um, let me start with, a, because I have uh, four minutes from what I understand, with a bit of a number. Uh, to emphasize what Maria Elena mentioned and the relevance of this particular dialogue. Uh, from our own studies uh, in UNEP, we see, and others as well, 60% of the global terrestrial biodiversity loss is linked to food production. 33% of soils are moderately to highly degraded due to erosion. So it's very clear even prior to this COVID-19 pandemic, the linkages between agriculture and environment are absolutely uh, scientifically proven and visible. So you asked me to speak about the challenges and I will share three uh, and offer an idea as well, uh, looking at this um, pandemic. One, it is very clear based on EBID studies and reports, the pandemic threatens to trigger the worst global food emergency in more than half a century. Uh, we are seeing huge disruptions of the global food supply chain due to the slowing of harvest. Uh, the lockdowns, including here in East Africa, for example, have completely disrupted the food markets and factories as well as agribusiness. Uh, but also in some areas we are seeing produce is being left to rot. So in terms of food wastage, uh, because of uh, lack of uh, transportation due to the pandemic, there is loss. Um, even though food uh, prices on average remain stable, but in many places we are seeing spikes of food prices increase. Uh, simply because uh, of the disruptions, uh, limited options, and the vendor's um, limitations as well. As a result, just by the end of this year, there are projections that we will probably see increasing numbers of, fa of uh, populations facing starvation. Uh, the World Bank, as well as the United Nations, have also indicated on average, we may see 49 million more people who for may be forced into absolute poverty by the end of this year. So one challenge is the uh, global food supply chains, but as well as domestic food supply chains. I think the second, and I will give specific examples, we're seeing a compound of multiple crises. What do I mean by that? For example, if you look at the East Africa region as an example, we're seeing extreme um, locust plague that have affected Kenya, Ethiopia, and Somalia. Here in Kenya, for example, they've had, in addition to dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic, the worst locust plague in 70 years of the country. And that is also affecting the agricultural, the environmental sector, as well as the food prices. But also prior and building on pre-COVID-19 climate change uh, challenges, last year, for example, uh, parts of East Africa saw the extreme drought that destroyed farmlands and pastures, which led to the food prices spike by up to 300. So the baseline, even pre-COVID pandemic, 
was quite uh, uh, gloomy to say the least. So the second is the compound of the COVID-19 pandemic on already very challenging biodiversity and food systems uh, uh, crisis that was already there before um, uh, uh, COVID. But also we should remember, as you mentioned, uh, as Maria Elena mentioned, this is a humanitarian issue. We are seeing job losses, uh, disruptions of agribusiness, as well as food chains. We started 2020 with aspirations and ambition for a super year of nature, but this has not turned out to be the case. So as we are rebuilding, as the countries are rebuilding the economies, we should save this moment as a chance to actually build back better and really reflecting and uh, these uh, linkages between agriculture and environment. So what is the lesson? I think we urgently need to make our food systems more resilient to shocks. Uh, I'm super excited to uh, learn more about the implementation of the farm uh, uh, to, to fork um, uh, strategy as well as biodiversity of the European Union, uh, because we could actually uh, use this time to reflect on how we can capitalize on shorter food chains which in turn would create markets for farmers and improve access to both inputs as well as outputs. I think we can also look at this crisis as a turning point to rebalance and transform our food systems, making them more inclusive, sustainable, resilient in support of the sustainable development goals. But also we must reduce post-harvest food losses at every stage of the value chain by improving access to low cost handling and storage technologies. And lastly, on water and energy saving irrigation, conservation agriculture, livestock grazing, management, energy efficient, exploration of technology to actually make a more sustainable uh, food system post COVID as we are rebuilding. So thanks again to FAO, to the uh, Commission, as well as to the European Union and the participants. And uh, on behalf of UNEP, I want to say uh, we are committed to work with all the partners to move this agenda forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Uh, um, Suya. Um, so I'm sure our audience will have a lot of questions uh, being inspired by your uh, remarks uh, later on. Let me now move to our panelists from the European Commission. The European Green Deal presented by the European Commission on the 11th of December 2019 sets an ambitious roadmap towards a climate neutral economy, decoupling economic growth from resource use. On May 20th, just last month, this year, uh, the farm to fork strategy and the biodiversity strategy were both presented as part of the European Green Deal. Mr. Calleja Crespo, we're delighted you are with us uh, today. You are the Director General at the Directorate General for Environment at the European Commission. So let me ask you, the European Union has very strong ambitions indeed, uh, both within Europe and on a global level. What are the initial key areas you will focus in the next months with the biodiversity and the farm to fork strategies? Thank you very much. And let me tell you what a pleasure it is to participate in this dialogue. And I would like my first words to thank and to welcome very warmly uh, both Maria Elena and Joyce with whom uh, we have excellent relations, both professional and personal, because I think we have to work hand in hand, as they were saying. Second thing I want to say from their interventions, it is clear that we are facing a very serious situation. Climate change, biodiversity loss, increased pollution, and the degradation of ecosystems are a serious problem. And all of this has been exacerbated by the COVID-19. Maria Elena was saying, nature is calling us. We need to put nature at the center and we need, it is urgent to fix our relationship with nature. And this is precisely what the commission is trying to do with the Green Deal and with both the biodiversity and with the farm to fork strategies. We want to highlight 
that nature is essential for life and that our planet, our economy depend on it because nature provides our food, our health and our well-being to continue our life in this planet. Half of global GDP, 40 trillion euros depends on nature. Answering your questions, what are the actions which the Commission proposes? In the area of biodiversity strategy, we have two blocks. We would like to be very concrete internally, but both globally in the external side. Internally and externally, because both are linked, we would like to do four things. Protect, restore, mainstream, and secure appropriate financing. Protect, we are proposing that in Europe, 30% of land and sea in Europe are protected areas, that we increase the level of protection. We are facing a problem of biodiversity loss. We need to increase the protection. And of these, one third should be strictly protected. Restore, we need to reconcile uh, the nature with economic activities, and we need to restore degraded areas. So we will have a new legal instrument with binding targets to restore degraded areas in Europe. We want to have more organic farming. We want to re reverse pollinators decline, increase the use and reduce the use and risk of pesticides 50% by 2030. We would like to restore 25,000 kilometers of EU rivers to ensure free flow and to plant 3 billion trees by 2030. And we would like to mainstream biodiversity across all the policies, because only if we integrate nature into the different policies, we will be able to succeed. And we will unlock 20 billion euros per year for biodiversity. This is within the EU. But globally, we have an appointment, a crucial appointment in Kunming, the Convention on Biodiversity. The IG targets come to an end. We need to design and put in place the new framework to 2030. And we would like to have in Kunming a Paris moment. We would like to agree on global targets in these areas. We would like to have commitments from the different countries. We would like to have monitoring of these commitments. And we think we would also need, we are ready to play a role there to secure the financing to engage in this area. All this strategy has no sense if we don't look at the farm to fork strategy, because this is a completely joint package, because we need to reconcile nature with agriculture, as Maria Elena was saying, and as Joyce was also saying, we need to implement in an integrated way all these issues. Implementation is already starting. This year, we will already adopt recommendations to the member states addressing the nine specific objectives of the common agricultural policy before the CAP strategic plans are submitted. And due to the COVID-19 pandemic, food security will be in the spotlight of the EU. By the end of the year, we will develop a contingency plan for ensuring food supply and food security. And this work is also starting now. We are in a nutshell trying to make sure that we have a more competitive, but also a more sustainable and a more efficient farming sector, which provides the food that we need, which ensures the right revenue for the farmers and that contributes to the objectives of the Green Deal. I would like to conclude by saying that by fixing our relationship by, with nature, by underlining how essential it is for our life, by insisting that our planet, our lives and our economy depend on it, we are just responding to a, something which is elementary, but which we may have neglected in the past. And this is the message of the Green Deal. This is the message that Europe wants to share with the rest of the world. It is not just words, it should be followed by actions. That we'll have to, we will have to ensure appropriate means for implementation, but there is no alternative. And the COVID-19 crisis has shown the urgency to act, to act now, to act efficiently, but also to act together. And I would like to emphasize this message, which comes also from Joyce and Maria Elena. We need to ensure global action. We need to ensure not only the member states, also the stakeholders, the different economic sectors, the regions, the cities, to go together 
in this direction. I think if we do so, we have a chance. We are not in a situation of gloom and doom. On the contrary, the problems are very serious, but we can fix them if we put the right policies in place and we act together. Thank you very much. We'll be following closely your efforts, uh, for sure. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Mr. Calleja Crespo. Um, let's now listen to Ms. Carla Montesi, Director for Planet and Prosperity at DigiDevGo. I know Ms. Montesi needs to go very soon. So um, quickly, my question is, uh, could you tell us more about the global dimension of the EU's paradigm shift to bring nature back? What is the EU doing on a global level to reverse the biodiversity loss and address its key drivers? As we know, the farm to fork and biodiversity strategies both include a very important external dimension. Ms. Montes, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's, uh, I would say it's a real pleasure to join you on this dialogue, Maria, dear Maria Elena, Joyce, Daniel and uh, very happy. Uh, now, my challenges will be try to avoid to repeat what was already said. So I will not mention the link with uh, uh, COVID because this was really mentioned by the previous intervention. Let my, me just say that, of course, this crisis demonstrates once again how it's important to, to tackle the key challenge that is to reconcile planet with economy for the benefit of, of the people. And as just Daniel said, this is uh, the ambition that we have. This is the ambition of uh, the Green Deal adopted in December. The Green Deal is really about strands of policy, of actions that ranges from the way we produce to the way we consume, taking into account our natural resources and uh, our people. So it's about a new growth model that takes into account the real value and the contribution of the nature and of the ecosystem. Now, as Daniel was mentioning, and uh, it's clear that uh, the Green Deal is about Europe, but we know very well that we cannot achieve all our ambitions uh, indicating the Green Deal without involving the other countries uh, through a global uh, integrated response. So uh, the global integrated response will be crucial because we know 90% of the global biodiversity is outside the European Union. So we cannot act alone. And this is the reason why all the strand of the Green Deal package could be the communication itself in Green Deal, could be the biodiversity or the farm to fork communication really outline the importance to have an external dimension and uh, to operate with other partners. As Daniel mentioned, this will be a job that we will have to do at global level. So we need to ensure that the world leaders must adopt an ambitious, realistic, uh, smart global framework of biodiversity in China next year. So it, I would say it will be essential that our leaders uh, put in place a framework that will be recognized by all stakeholders, also all the stakeholders outside the biodiversity sphere. Like this, we will have a, a legitimate action, a legitimate vector for the transformation that we expect to have from our citizens and the local communities. So this uh, event, the CBD COP in China will be an essential moment at multilateral level. But one other essential moment will be also that was already mentioned will be, of course, the Food System Summit. Because uh, uh, in the Food System Summit, of course, it will be really very important to ensure the link, to ensure the biodiversity dimension in all the debate and reaching the Food System Summit. So we will have this big two summit, two high level uh, that we will have to use to uh, really find a solution to these challenges. And I can say, as Daniel already mentioned, the European Union is really uh, engaged in participating, contributing to these two events in order to have successful uh, results. Now, 
to be more concrete on the seminal dimension, uh, let me say that, of course, farm to fork and biodiversity has uh, uh, integrates all the seminal dimension. It's uh, very important that we will use all the panoply of instruments that we have. This will be the green diplomacy, our external cooperation, the international partnership, including the trade agreements, in order to promote what will be the message of the farm to fork on the biodiversity strategy with our partner countries. So in these two communications, we have really foreseen for joint action with our partner countries on key elements that were already mentioned, preserving biodiversity, ocean and forest, promoting sustainable agriculture, safe food, reducing pollution. And so we will be engaged in working with our partner countries into this subject. As you know, we are moving for, to the next financial perspective. We will have very soon the new financial portfolio. And as you know, the Commission has proposed that at the least we have 25% of our external aid that will be dedicated to climate and to environment program. Of course, we don't want to limit ourselves to the 25%, but at least this 25% will have to be ensured. This implies that now when we will go for the preparation of the what we call the programming exercise, so our big dialogue with the partner countries in order to ensure how we mobilize this financial portfolio, our priority in our strategy will be clearly the priority that we have mentioned in all the Green Deal package. Um, so the intention will be to, of course, to work with the partner countries to ensure a more integrated approach of biodiversity and the food system, and that this will be the crucial element. I think Maria Elena and Joyce has already mentioned this integrated approach will be the key uh, element for the, uh, the strategic dialogue with our partner countries. At the level of action, of course, we will think to have dedicated environmental action to protect, to ensure the sustainable use, to restore our ecosystem. Um, but of course, it was already mentioned, it will be key uh, to ensure the biodiversity. Uh, the biodiversity mainstreaming. So I will say that the biodiversity mainstreaming that say putting biodiversity in all the key areas, the intention is really to move this biodiversity mainstreaming to a new quantitative and the quality level. Now, the link uh, with the everything that is in agriculture, with the food agricultural system, uh, it's clear there in the communication. I think when we talk about the partner countries, we cannot deny what the challenge is, because of course many African countries come to us saying, okay, but our, challenging, our challenge is also that we need to provide access to enough good quality food in a sustainable way, but we need also a take into account the growing, the richer population, so we need to have, in any case, enough food for our population. So the challenges will be there, how we will succeed to face the answer on growing uh, and the richer population with, of course, taking into account the adaptation to climate change and to the need that we need to avoid the negative impact on the environment and on the biodiversity. So this element will be key in our dialogue with our partner countries. And uh, of course, uh, in everything that we will do and we will support in the agriculture uh, domain, in the agriculture uh, in, uh, uh, project program, we will have to, uh, we say, prioritize the transition towards a sustainable agri-food system. This means, of course, uh, um, to use uh, the, all the agri-ecological agri approach sorry for the noise of my phone, so to use all the agricultural approach that can provide alternatives to the use of chemical pesticide and the fertilizer. Um, 
giving importance to the agroforestry and to the integration of the landscape and the territorial approach. And of course, we need also to look to the role of the agrobiodiversity. Uh, All these uh, subjects were already mentioned, of course, will be part, key part of our action on the uh, everything that will be looked to the agriculture. Let me say that, uh, uh, of course, um, it's all the domain where we have really worked with uh, FAO, with UNEP. Uh, you are, of course, our key partners in order to be able to push for the dialogue with our partner countries, but also to ensure that we put in place a uh, good strategy and good action, good program that allow us to link and to identify uh, an answer to all these challenges. So I hope to continue to work uh, uh, strongly with you at the multilateral uh, level to prepare our two big summit, but also working with you during our uh, programming exercise through the reinforcement of our dialogue with the partner countries to ensure that our partner countries want and intend to keep the same challenges that, that at the European level in their countries. Many thanks and over to you. Thank you very much for the very complete and very comprehensive uh, reply. Uh, you can count, of course, uh, as you know, on us uh, for, for your work. Um, let me invite you uh, to stay with us for the questions from our audience. And I will move now to the second part of the discussion. But before I move to the second part, uh, and since we will be starting with FAO's forestry director, I will ask my colleagues to play the second video. This video was produced for the recently launched flagship report, The State of the World's Forests, that FAO co-published for the first time ever with the UN Environment Program. Video, please. Our forests are home to an astonishing 80% of life on land and abound with an amazing variety of creatures, big and small. You know some of them, others might surprise you. Even the tiniest of creatures play a crucial role, working hard to sustain life, enabling trees and all the other remarkable plants to grow sometimes even unnoticed. They are the heroes in the circle of life that keeps our planet healthy. But today, this biodiversity is under serious threat. Millions of hectares of forest are being lost every year. We need to care for our only home by caring for our forests. Mete, you are the, the director of the FAO Forestry Policy and Resources Division. And as I said before, together with UNEP, FAO launched last month the report on the state of the world's forests. The report builds, of course, on the forest resource assessment and focuses on the contributions to biodiversity. No doubt we need to transform the way we manage our forests. Can you give us in two minutes, if possible, an example of how we can manage the world's forest ecosystems in order to both ensure the conservation and sustainable use of their biodiversity. Thank you, Mirto, and thanks for inviting me to this dialogue. As you heard and as you saw in the video, the world forests uh, harbor the vast majority of the global biodiversity found on land, uh, even some of the aquatic life too. Unfortunately, the Global Forest Resources Assessment 2020 also tells us that we're losing about 10 million hectares of forest each year through to deforestation and conversion to other uses. That means that within three years, we're losing an area of forest that's about the size of the country of Italy. Most of that is in the tropics and subtropics, and agricultural expansion is responsible for 73% of that. So to change this and to conserve the world's biodiversity, we need to protect, manage and restore our forests. And we work in very close collaboration with the European Commission to do so. 
Together with UNEP and with UNDP, we lead the UN RED program, which supports 65 countries worldwide to better monitor their forests and to develop strategies to reduce the level of deforestation and forest degradation. And the European Commission is a very active member of the governing body of that program. In addition, we have the EU FAO Forest Law Enforcement Governance and Trade Program, which helped put in place an enabling framework to hold illegal logging and to promote the trade in legal timber to help ensure that forests are worth more when managed than when cut down and converted to other uses. Um, but as you've heard, more forests are more than just trees and timber. And as mentioned with, by Maria Elena Semedo, millions of people rely on hunting and fishing to provide them with animal protein and essential nutrients. And the sustainable wildlife management program um, that we jointly carry out together with the European Commission, 12 ACP countries and a consortium of partners help to find ways to ensure that hunting levels remain sustainable by monitoring wildlife population levels by reducing the demand for wild meat in cities and towns and providing alternative sources of such protein. That's a way in which we can conserve biodiversity and at the same time ensure food security. And lastly, we need to repair the damage done and the action against desertification program that we carry out in collaboration with the EC and the ACP secretariat does just that. It helps restore and expand the natural resources in the Sahel, Fiji and Haiti, some of the poorest countries of the world. And in the Sahel, this work is part of the Great Green Wall and focusing on innovative ways to restore indigenous plants and trees. And as you've heard, we've just published the State of the World's Forest 2020, focusing on forest biodiversity and people. And there are lots of examples there on how we can combine the conservation and the sustainable use of our forest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Mr. Hussein, Mete just mentioned the alarming rate of deforestation and forest degradation. I'm sure Eduardo Mansour from the Land uh, and Water Division of FAO will later ring the alarm for the degradation of our soils. And I'm sure Manuel Barange will talk about the continuous overfishing. But at the same time, population growth and climate change raise additional concerns in finding a balance and achieve more sustainable food production. How can we decouple food system activities from environmental degradation? Major, thank you. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. Um, I have kind of two taglines and two responses to that. The first of those is we have to measure what matters. And the second response is that once we have the appropriate measurement, we then have to use economic valuation to support our interventions, to make the economic case for those interventions. So first on measuring what matters, we all know, I think, or many people know that, say for instance, in terms of macroeconomics, if we only rely on gross domestic product, GDP, and to signify how well we're doing in terms of our well-being, then that is an inappropriate indicator. Similarly, in the agricultural domain, we also have a situation where for decades now, research entities around the world have focused very much on improving yields per hectare. Now, if we just look at yields per hectare, what we end up doing is, of course, focusing on yields per hectare as a single metric, irrespective of the consequences that that has on ecosystems. But agriculture, more than any other sector globally, has both a dependency on well-functioning ecosystems and also an impact on well-functioning ecosystems. So what we need to do is understand, recognize the fact that ecosystems provide to agriculture, for instance, pollination services, hydrological services, um, cultural services, regulating services, as well as those things that are readily measured, such as, say, for instance, the value of timber, the value of um, corn, et cetera. So the first thing we need to do is change the way we measure. So measure better and include ecosystem services and the linkages and dependencies. And once we have that, the second part of the equation, sometimes it's just enough to measure in quantitative terms the biophysical elements, but certainly as TEAB coordinator, the Economics of Ecosystems Biodiversity, my role and what we're doing a lot of in terms of UNEP is to also think about valuation. Now we have a project with the EU is funding from the foreign policy um, FPI, uh, foreign policy instrument, I mean, seven countries where we're doing just that. We're trying to actually assess the changes that occur 
by applying scenarios which include, as per your question, Myrtle, changes in population, um, projection to the climate change, and look at a business usual scenario, but overlay on that an alternative scenario for intervention. So we engage with policymakers and stakeholders in the first instance to make sure that the scenario that we're looking at is possible, is coherent. We have the governance structures in place to actually implement a change. We then look at the changes in ecosystem services and also what we call human and social capital. A human capital and social capital are linked to communities, they're linked to innovation, they're linked to people. So once we have an assessment of those chains, we can then make the case for an intervention option which also is both pro-conservation but critically pro-livelihoods. And it's basically valuing that impact and dependency which hitherto hasn't happened. So with the EU um, FPI project, we have in Indonesia recently carried out an assessment of agroforestry. And a consequence of that assessment is that agroforestry is now included for the first time in the five-year development plan that BAPANA submitted to the president, which has now been concluded. So I think that's a step in the right direction. We have evidence that measuring better and then valuing those changes can make an impact. We should do so with coherent scenarios that include population change, et cetera. And if we do move toward measuring better, including ecosystem services, including social and human capital, the things that we all depend on, then I think we can make a very positive step in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you very much. Really an interesting reply. Let me ask you now, Eduardo. Uh, you're the director of FAO Land and Water Division. Your division is responsible for integrated landscape management. We heard a lot from Ms. Montesi, from the other high-level panelists. Why has integrated landscape management become extremely relevant in addressing the needs of farmers, but also allows for a more sustainable systems? Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mirko, and uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's a very important point on the integrated landscape management approaches. And uh, first of all, let me congratulate the European Union for the landscapes for, future, for our future program. They aim to reconciliate climate change adaptation, mitigation, ecosystem conservation, sustainable agriculture, and food security objects at the landscape level. I think it says it all. I mean, when we talk about biodiversity, that, for instance, at the CBD level, we are talking about genes, genetic resource, we talk about species, but we are also talking about ecosystems. And the, the way that we look at the ecosystems has to be through this integrated landscape approach. We are very happy to work with the EU in a consortium uh, that has been recently established with other partners to implement sustainable integrated landscape management. We are aiming at the first stage in about 23 countries and involving different aspects, not only the physical aspects, the knowledge aspects, but also the governance aspects of tenure, of investment, which so it's action on the ground. Uh, when we talk about uh, this type of action on integrated landscape management, we are reflecting the concrete contribution to the UNDK on ecosystem restoration and to the sustainable development goals, especially the SDG 15.3, in this case, on achieving land degradation neutral work. Um, FAO is busy now working its own program contribution to the decade which is focusing on restoration of degraded production ecosystems, ecosystems, both landscapes and seascapes that are used to uh, produce food, feed and fiber uh, that are, are needed for human consumption. So the integration is essential as farmers, as those who use the resources do not look at one angle only. They have to have the, the, the platter of this. Particular attention are important to, to dry lands in the, uh, food and agriculture, uh, food systems and agriculture in dry lands are particularly challenging. This challenge is being uh, exacerbated by, by climate change and by the recent uh, pandemic. So um, we have to, to pay particular attention to this. And in this regard, uh, uh, Mirko, I'd like to bring uh, two specific areas of the land and water division into attention of this event. One is related to water scarcity and the competition for water resources, especially grown now due to the COVID-19 pandemic. So we are looking at ways to, to respond to the needs for what in the water world is called the wash, you know, the water sanitation and hygiene, together with the need for water for agriculture, which is the bulk of the water use. So we're developing a program, smart irrigation, smart wash, combining both, or on crop productivity assessment from remote sensing, 
based on water productivity. We use, we have a nice collaboration with Copernicus on this. We have a water productivity online um, uh, open source uh, program that helps assess the use of water resource and crop productivity, biomass productivity through uh, water consumption and evapotranspiration. Another area important in this ground is One Water, One Health, looking at the need of water for livestock and meat production on a healthy system. So the link between water uh, management and health and the link between water management and ecosystems are essential because at the end, the competition for water resources is big, but one of these needs is the environmental flows that you have to maintain for ecosystem health. So the combination of this is very important in the landscape approach. Last but not least, let me bring one particular program that we are developing that relates to the topic we are discussing here. It's the importance of soil biodiversity in sustainable agriculture. EU is a very important partner for us on promoting sustainable soil management through the Global Soil Partnership. And this year, we have been working very, very hard on increasing the knowledge of uh, soil biodiversity. We didn't have much on this, and uh, we are organizing a global symposium, which was supposed to be held in March this year. Now it's transferred for next year. Uh, and we, we produced the soil biodiversity assessment and got some interesting message. Soil organisms drive the process of food production, of purif purifying soil water, of preserving uh, health well-being of humans and the biosphere. And our current understanding of the soil microorganisms in plant growth, transformation of pollutants has grown and has been more linked to agriculture. Labs have been now able to analyze uh, uh, it's different from past decades. Now the research moves from individual species, I'm talking about microorganisms, into whole communities of organisms. And that opened up very big opportunity for improving sustainable soil management and so soil biodiverse management for food production, environmental protection. So uh, if we manage to get better soil uh, management practices, avoiding soil degradation, protecting soil biodiversity, we go a long way because my, soil microbiodiversity facilitate organic matter decomposition, so improving soil quality, increase aggregation, encourage for, uh, formation of colloids, improve nutrient, but for the plants also, it serves as seed and seedies, uh, seedling inoculants for germination, stimulating growth, there are a number of interactions and symbiotic uh, collaboration for fixing nitrogen, for, bio, uh, for, for mitigating plant and pest disease that goes on managing soil biodiversity. For animal production, is not different because probiotics, prebiotics help increase diversity in gut flora in animals, enhance feed conversion, stimulate immune systems, uh, goes a long way in, uh, in management of stable, reducing nitrogen volatility and, and, and uh, on, on waste valorization, also on degraded crop residues and stabilizing manure, accelerated composting. So it's a whole new world that we are opening up with the soil biodiversity that we are going to bring to Kunin, that we are going to bring to, because we are doing this work together with the, 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 the CBD secretariat. So, but basically to close, I would like to say that implementing integrated landscape management and focusing on implementing sustainable, integrated water resource management in this ground and sustainable soil management implementing the voluntary guidelines on soil management that have been approved in 2016. The fertilizers code that has been approved now in 2019 by FAO conference goes a long way in improving soil conservation, land conservation, restoration, and biodiversity as a whole. So this is my contribution at this stage. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eduardo, a very rich contribution with a lot of information and a lot of resources you gave us. I'd just like to remind uh, our audience that everything is in the chat box. Uh, my colleagues are putting a lot of links that you can find there. Uh, also, the, the panelists, of course, are inserting a lot of links uh, you can see there. Um, all right, so we discussed uh, about uh, uh, forest and land and soils. Uh, we should now look a little bit at our seas and lakes the home of our fisheries and aquaculture. Manuel Barrage, a few days ago, you launched the State of the World's Fisheries and Aquaculture Report with a special section dedicated to the impact of COVID-19 on the sector. FAO has also produced a very comprehensive policy brief. My, my colleagues will put uh, in the chat box again, um, which was on the same issue. My question is, 
how can we make sure the sustainability issues in fisheries are integrated in the COVID-19 response? Thank you. Thank you, Mirto, and thank you everyone for being here today and for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, indeed, we often forget that fish are crucial in uh, our sustainable food systems. They are often undervalued for their protein and micronutrient contributions, the low carbon footprint, and their almost no need for water or land. Uh, the 2020 FAO report on the state of fisheries and aquaculture, which, as you said, was released this month, mentioned that in 2018, we achieved an all-time record in fish production for human use, 153 million tons. This is equivalent to 20.5 kilograms per capita, more than twice the 1960s per capita consumption, and shows how the sector has contributed to poverty alleviation and to better nutrition across the world. The SOFIA report has a number of very clear messages in relation to the sustainability of fisheries. In particular, one of them I'll mention here, that fish populations under intense management, and those includes the European managed resources in the Northeast Atlantic, are rebuilding and are increasingly sustainable. While those that are poorly managed, about a third of all fisheries around the world are deteriorating. It is for this reason that we say that effective fisheries management is the best conservation because it balances biodiversity concerns and food security needs by applying the ecosystem approach. The FAO SOFIA report, as you mentioned, has an addendum on COVID-19. And what we have learned in assessing the impact of the pandemic in the sector are two things. First, that we need to reactivate value chains. For example, removing barriers to trade, supporting digitization and incentivizing value adding. And second, that we need to support fishing communities better. For example, ensuring they have access to emergency funding, to insurance and income loss schemes and to alternative livelihoods. In this context, I'd like to thank the European Commission in particular for their support to the work that we do in FAO and particularly for the recent funding for FAO to implement a fish value chains program with the African, Caribbean and Pacific Secretariat. This program is called Fish for ACP. It's a 40 million euro program analyzing 10 specific value chains in ACP countries, which will be increased with additional funding from the Republic of Korea and Germany to more than 15 uh, value chains, assessing how to support, enhance and develop them. The work is completely applicable and relevant to the responses to COVID-19 because it focuses on improving the low economic performance, the limited market access and the poor social and environmental sustainability of some of these value chains. And indeed, to improve their resilience to cope with external shocks, present and future. I wish to acknowledge here briefly the ACP Secretariat as well as the Commission for the excellent collaboration and look forward to opportunities to continue working together for a common goal of ending hunger and poverty and improving the well-being of those in need. Thank you very much. Thank you, Manuel. My colleagues are also inserting the link for the SOFIA report you just mentioned in the uh, chat box. I were receiving a very high number of questions in the Q&A box, and it is really great to see our audience so eager to contribute and interact. So before going into your questions, uh, I'm delighted to invite for a very quick reaction, His Excellency, the Ambassador of Costa Rica to the Rome-based agencies and the Holy See, Mr. Federico Zamora Cordero. Excellency, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Mirto, and um, my special greetings to Maria Elena Semedo and uh, Eduardo Mansur here in Rome, and Rodrigo de la Puerta in Brussels, uh, with whom we've been working uh, a lot in this, uh, all this uh, environmental issues. Thank you very much for all your efforts. Uh, buenos dias, excellencies, colleagues, ladies, and gentlemen. I am grateful for the space offered to my delegation, this high level panel. I would like to take this opportunity to discuss about some of the actions that Costa Rica has implemented regarding biodiversity and sustainable resource man management. Costa Rica is one of the few historical examples of success in reversing deforestation. Unfortunately, logging led to severe deforestation, which meant that by 1983, the country's forest coverage was only 25%, 26% of the national te territory. 
However, and thanks to consistent environments, public policies, and public policies, the country stopped and the, the forest destruction and even reversed it. Today, forest coverage has increased to 52%. This, together with continuous economic development, proves that protection and development can coexist hand in hand. Furthermore, in 2019, and for the fifth, fifth consecutive year, 98% 98, 98 of the Costa Rica's electricity was generated by renewable resources. In a, in a large extent, this was being achieved after the abolition of the army in 1948, which has made possible to redirect economic, economic resources towards health, educa education, and environment. Currently, the country is implementing actions to reach the total de decarbonization of the economy, working to the zero emissions uh, by 2050. In fact, in June last year, President Carlos Alvarado presented the National Strategy for Decarbonization, which contains 10 focus areas which, with specific goals in fields such as agriculture, land use, livestock, and land management. The initiative is oriented towards conservation and sustainable use, being aligned with the SDGs of the United Nations Agenda 2030. As part of the sectoral initiatives to advance in the decarbonization, Costa Rica is promoting a new concept of payment for ecosystem services called PES 2.0, which seeks to innovate the traditional PES and extend it to soil carbon sequestration. Costa Rica has the technical and scientific cap capacity to propose and innovate in this field. The PES 2.0 initiative has been presented to FAO management and it is and it is in line with REC soil and the and the approaches of the Global Soil Partnership. This provides a new model with accepted methodologies and metrics to establish a finances financing system together through excuse me through international cooperation, which we believe will come reality in the short term. At the international level, the country is co-leading together with France, the High Ambition Coalition for Natural, Natural Nature and People, supported by 20 countries. The coalition aims to pr pr protect 30% of the planet by bringing coordinated political efforts to international forums. In addition to these previous initiatives, Costa Rica is promoting the concept of biodiversity and people, which seeks the, to protect the environment and enhance sustainable and indigenous agricultural practices. The idea is to generate pathways to re res resilience and climate action in vul vulnerable populations such as Afro-descendants and indigenous people. The initiative focuses on the empowerment of women, understanding the strategic nexus between bio, biocultural diversity, natural resource conservation, and the protection of traditional knowledge. Costa Rica is committed to work with the European Union. Our intention is to create synergies, share knowledge and good practices, and strengthen, strengthen cooperation with major initiatives such as European Commission Green Deal. Finally, I would like to mention that COVID-19 crisis forces us to scale up sustainable development with due care of the environment, biodiversity, and natural resources. Many scientists agree that our environment behave, environmental behavior, mainly deforestation, the invasion and the invasion of wildlife habitats, is helping so so zoonotic diseases to spread more frequently. The environment is calling us to act. Attending this call must be mandatory for everyone in the world. This is an open invitation to make commitments and to work together hand in hand. To conclude, I find appropriate to address Pope Francis' words pronounced to, to pronounce during a recent message. God always forgives, man sometimes. But when nature is mistreated, it never forgives. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much for your attention. Muchas gracias a usted.
Uh, indeed, the words of the Holy Father give us hope and inspiration in the most challenging moments. Thank you, Excellency. We have also with us Marlene Mortler, member of the European Parliament and the European Parliamentary Alliance Against Hunger and Malnutrition. Mrs. Mortler, the floor is yours for your brief comments. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for your great contribution during this challenging weeks. Thank you, Maria Helena, and thank you, Rodrigo, to you and to your hardworking team. I say hello to you all as a member of the Alliance Against Hunger and More Nutrition of the EP, and I really be proud of it. For a thriving biodiversity, we need a thriving agriculture, I'm convinced. Let me tell you a short story. A story from Chuck Libel. He's one of the greatest pianists and keyboardists in rock and roll history. And he divides his talents between music, forestry, and family. He was on tour with the Rolling Stones with Eric Lepton and others. And he was one of the biggest names in environmental forestry and he was selected National Tree Farmer of the Year in the United States. His commitment to the planet and his strong family ties are refreshing reminders to be kind and treat your neighbor with respect. As Lavelle puts it, if you cut a tree down, plant two for the next guy. I met Chuck in Berlin during the Green Week and he gave me one of his books called Forever Green. And this book is dedicated to his family, to my wonderful wife, Rose Lane, and our beautiful daughters, Amy and Ashley. May we always remember our ties and responsibility to the earth and let us thrive to be the best stewards of the land we can be. I'm convinced the key is not to look for the guilty in these days, but to find solution. Chuck lived in the city before and inherited a forest and his grandmother's old country house. And he had no idea, no experience, but he had, but he made the best of it, his goal, to protect and to exploit wood to stay in balance. Some words out of his book. Today, I am deeply grateful to have dared to take the step and the adventure continues. I learned a lot about biodiversity, our ecosystem, how to handle wild animals and the habitat. Today, I know what responsible solid management and professional farming methods can achieve. I have also learned to work with nature, to be patient and not to rush into things. My experience tells me that the more you have learned, the more there is to learn. And I have learned a lot about myself by taking long walks in the forest and having time for my thoughts and my soul in nature. The most important thing I have learned is that there is a delicate balance in our world and that it is up to us to understand this balance and work to maintain it. It is my task to maintain or even stabilize this balance on our charline plantation and to help others understand how we can maintain this balance in our country in our world and still use our most valuable natural resource in a beneficial way. Gradually, a great astonishment and admiration for the forests and their spirit has grown in me and for the forest farmers. And now that connection, forest, wood, to the music. Without wood, no keyboard, he told me. Without knowledge and appreciation of the origins of our music, we cannot create new sound forms. Similarly, without an understanding of the value of trees and their significance of our present life, our past and our future, we will not be able to fully exploit their potential 
or prepare our forest for future generations. And this would indeed endanger our existence. Why do I tell you this story? I think Level is an untiring advocate for the protection of forests and should be a role model for all of us. Let's start the new month with confidence. I thank you. Thanks very much, Mr. Mortler. Uh, looking at the time, I think it's really time to uh, go into our questions from the audience. Thank you for being so active. Uh, the first question is for FAO. Uh, Maria Elena perhaps could reply and Mr. Hussein. We have a question from Defne Inhan from the Baja International Community that highlights the central role of agriculture to preserve the biodiversity, feed the world and enhance social and economic development worldwide and the need of new approaches to fulfill agriculture's potential. What are FAO's and UNEP's approaches to address this and how do you engage with other local and international stakeholders with this vision? Perhaps Maria Elena could start. Is Maria Elena still online? If not, we can start with Mr. Hussein. Thanks, very happy to do so. Thank you for the question as well. Um, there's a need for a fundamental change as the question has, has set out and transform, transformational change. Um, I set out in my, my brief comments, I think one of, the reason, one of the mechanisms by which we can do that through actually measuring what, what matters. And what I didn't manage to speak about in my two minutes is the fact that measuring what matters should also embrace what happens locally. Um, valuation as a tool is a human construct. And if the individuals who are actually affected by a particular change in an ecosystem, in agriculture, are those which are local communities, which is typically the case, then we have to include valuation of their systems and what matters to them. So I think that's extremely important in terms of creating a transformative change and including local decision makers on the ground. I see the responses from UNEP and our, our colleagues and, um, and those we work with on the ground as being complementary. So UNEP and FAO at the kind of higher level, I think, are trying to change the conditions under which farming communities, agro, um, agroforestry, people working in agroforestry, et cetera, operate. So if there's a situation where there are perverse subsidies, where people are incentivized to take not the actions which complement nature, but actually actions that destroy nature, then I think what we have to do as international organizations, partnering with local communities, is send that message very strongly and explain that in economic terms, it's entirely perverse. It makes no sense because these impacts are actually felt by real human beings as opposed to by, um, by, the, by anyone else. So we do that at the international organization level. We collaborate very strongly between UNEP and FAO to achieve that, but that must be coupled with on the ground implementation. So we have to look at changing the environment in which farmers and agribusiness operate, but at local level, to try and engage at local level to understand what the local needs are and through a participatory approach, develop scenarios and develop the governance that allows local communities to take hold of the problem and to actually mitigate some of the um, implications for and impacts on nature which would otherwise take place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Maria Elena Semedo is uh, back with us perhaps now. Well, let's move to a question for Eduardo Mansour. Um, we have a question from. Can uh, I? I oh, of I, course, I have, of course, Maria. Problems Lena. with my my sound. Would you like me to repeat the question? Yes. Of course. Uh, so don't mind. Absolutely not. We have a question from Defne Inhan from the Baja International Community that highlights the central role of agriculture to preserve biodiversity, feed the world, and enhance social and economic development worldwide, and the need of new approaches to fulfill agriculture's potential. What are FAO's and UNEP's approaches to address this? And how do you engage with other local and international stakeholders with this vision? 
Okay, let me start by reminding that in 2019, uh, FAO published the state of the world's biodiversity for food and agriculture. And the report shows that we are completely off track. Uh, several of the species were disappearing. And this world state of uh, biodiversity for food and agriculture was followed by the IUCN report. And we could see that uh, the decline of biodiversity undermines the foundation of our uh, food system. For our food security, we are using four, four crops. And this needed that we need to diversify, but we need also to increase biodiversity friendly practices. Uh, and the use of these biodiversity friendly practices is where FAO with its partners, uh, we are working, how we can better support the farmers, how we can work at the global level to be more sustainable. And we talk about agroforestry, we talk about uh, ecosystem approach to fisheries, we talk about agroecology uh, as practices we should to upgrade and we should be emphasized as nature-based solution. On the other side, we need to be working together. It's not only FAO, it's not only UNEP, but we need to work with uh, UN, we need to work with the private sector, we need to work with the farmers community. And uh, we believe that the COP15 will bring us new approaches and a new call for us to have a joint approach to protect biodiversity, where we bring all the stakeholders together and making better link between agriculture sector, food system, biodiversity, and ecosystem services at the farm, at the landscape and the seascape approach. And even just to give you an example, now we are discussing the Food System Summit. And one of the questions coming is, what are the trade-offs we need? Because sometimes when we need to increase production, productivity, maybe it will be against the protection of biodiversity. And what should be the good balance in order to consider and to take into consideration those trade-offs. We need to work at all levels, we need to work together, and we need to come up with joint and holistic solutions, including all the stakeholders in the agriculture sectors. And when I talk about agriculture sector, I'm talking about forestry, fisheries, uh, all the sectors, not only the crop. Thank you. Thank you very much, Maria Elena. Uh, we have a question for Eduardo Mansour uh, from a partner in Ghana. It's related to the importance of livestock in the restoration of degraded grazing lands. The colleague asks how to support herder communities to be involved in restoring ecosystems and secure their rights over lands. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the, the gentleman from Ghana who put the question. I try to respond also and provide the link in the in the in in, in, in the, the Q and A part of the the, the, the Zoom, uh, so you can get it there. Basically, rangeland management and pasture land management can go a long way in providing um, uh, benefits for societies. But the issue of tenure that is raised there also needs to be addressed. So uh, we, we put the link to a paper that has been produced a couple of years ago, was improving governance of, of pastoral lands. Basically, you know that FAO produced the voluntary guidelines for the responsible governance of tenure of land, fishers and forests, the VGGT, that's known as the acronym. There is a specific zoom in on governance of pasture lands. And uh, the recommendations that are in this technical guide can help the colleague address the issues. We'll be happy to follow up. I don't want to take much time on this, but we'll be happy to follow up. It's a fundamental in, 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 of importance to 
because 25% of the land of the planet is grassland and herder communities, especially nomadic communities, form a large part of the society in the Sahel. And uh, it's part of their livelihoods. Uh, so it's important to be preserved and to be enhanced. Thank you very much, Eduardo. We're beyond uh, the time, allocated time for that. I would like to invite uh, Maria Elena Semedo if she wants to say a couple of uh, last words to close the session. Uh, thank you, Mirto, and uh, thank you all the participants for being here with us today. I think it has been a very useful uh, discussion and insightful, if I can say, showing us that uh, it's possible. It's possible to have a world where biodiversity, food security, sustainable agriculture, they can go along together, but this means that uh, we change our mindset, we change the way we do with our practices, but it cannot be doing alone. It needs uh, so civil society, it needs farmers, it needs states, it needs international organization. We need to be all together. I believe what has been shown here today, we have the solutions. The solutions are there. We don't need to reinvent the wheel, but let's implement what we have, what we have been working together. Let's see how we can measure what we are doing, because the one thing it has been said here, we need data, we need reliable data, but we need to monitor progress. While we are talking about the agenda 2030, and I think the challenge made by COVID, are we already off track? What COVID will bring us maybe, it will be a new ways of doing things, more innovation, maybe more green building back better, building back green, where we can be together and we can be with more, uh, more, more solutions where the 2030 agenda maybe can be more feasible. But what I can say, we need cooperation, we need, we need investment, we need innovation, and we need out of the box solutions to be together. Uh, European Union has been a big partner of FAO. We are willing to contribute and to strengthen our cooperation with these new two uh, innovative uh, instruments, if I can call them instruments, the Green Deal or policies and the biodiversity strategy. FAO has already its biodiversity strategy. How we can be integrating and synergizing our efforts together for a better world, a world where maybe we'll be having no more zoonosis, no more pandemic coming, but where we'll be able to feed all the population in a sustainable way. Thank you again all for being here. Thank you the colleagues from the office in Lawn for organizing this event, Rodrigue and the team, the, the, also to the colleagues of uh, European Commission, it's al always a pleasure. And we look forward to having you with us on the 23rd uh, of June in order to follow up our discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, Madame Semedo. So this series of webinars of FAO Brussels will be continued. So please uh, do stay tuned and follow us on Twitter at FAO Brussels. Finishing our session today, I would like to show the last video. It's a fascinating and particularly innovative program financed by the European Union, led by FAO and managed by a consortium of partners. Samete Wilkie mentioned it before. With field projects in three continents, the Sustainable Wildlife Management Program aims to improve the conservation and sustainable use of wildlife in forests, savannas, and wetland ecosystems. Let's look at the video and thanks again very much for being with us today.
Thank you, everybody. Great lunch. Fun mm -hmm. time. Bye, bye now. Thank you. Ciao, Rodrigo. Ciao. Ciao. Bye. Thanks a lot. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, -bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.